I've been blessed by this series. I hope, hope you all have too. And, uh, just preparing the sermons and stuff has kind of made me realize so much more about Moses and maybe even some of the things that the Israelites and the Egyptians were going through. This series is going to come to a close real soon, but for today, it's not over yet. I think it actually comes to a close next week. But this is kind of what the Israelites will be thinking right about now. They've just crossed over that Red Sea on the bottom, on dry land, walls of water on each side, and they've made it to the other side. They're starting to look around and say, hey, things have changed, things are different, we've escaped slavery, we've escaped the Egyptians. See, they, they thinking, they're thinking at this point that the end is near. Or is it? Or is it? A couple examples of when you think the end is near and it's not. Back in 1986, one of the most famous World Series ever, and probably the most famous heir of all time. Many of you might have watched that game. I know I did. I was eight years old watching this, and I saw Bill Buckner, a former Cub, let that ball go between his legs. If he had just caught that ball, it was over. It looked like it was over. All he had to do was pick it up, step on first base, and Boston Red Sox are going to win the World Series. But instead, it went through his legs, and the New York Mets scored and they scored again, and then the next night, they won the World Series of 1986. The end was near, or was it? That's one example I got for you. How about this next one? Lawn mowers. Now, you know what? I thought we could, there's so many illustrations we could use this week, but I'm sick of snow illustrations, amen? Let's use some lawn mower illustrations. Uh, I knew a guy once that owned a hardware store, and he said that, the most popular thing that he heard people say when they bought a lawnmower was, I hope and I think this is the last lawnmower I'll ever buy. Now think about that. When you buy that lawnmower and you think, this is the last one, there's a, lot, this is a, there's a lot of things that must be going through your mind at that time. Here's a few that I, I, that I thought of. What are you thinking is going to happen? That this is a lot, what's going to make this the last lawnmower you're ever going to buy? Are you going to die first? Right? Or, after this one, this one stops working, are you going to pay someone else to cut it? Or are you going to, when this one stops working, move into an apartment? Or, are you going to hope that God keeps your grass at four inches tall? <laughs> or are you hoping that it's never going to wear out? Now, I know some of you all have had your lawnmowers for a long time. Les has had his for like 25 years, I think. But I also know you've had it over Tommy Hoover's house a lot. <laughs> they wear out. They wear out. It's, it's inevitable that it probably won't be the last lawnmower that you are going to buy. There's some things, though, that we just really hope will end. Like this week, I think a lot of us that are on the Internet, we all saw a big controversy in our world this week, didn't we? What color is the dress? Now, if you don't know about this, if you, if you live in a cave where you don't have a computer, right? basically what happened was someone posted this dress up on the internet and said, what color is it? And somehow or another, there was controversy. This is a white and gold dress, right? Who sees white and gold on this picture right now? Are you serious? Who sees black and blue on this picture right now? Like this picture, you see black and blue. <laughs> Man, we have to pray for you guys. <laughs> but see, this is why the controversy started. Maybe this controversy will never end. I think there's something with the picture that they took, obviously. Because in all actuality, this dress, they said, is black and blue, not white and gold. But the picture I see right now, that is white, and that frilly stuff is gold. There's no doubt in my mind, that's what I see. But, but, to get back to the point... This is one of those things that we all just wish would go away at this point, right? Is it, is, the end is near, or is it? It just keeps dragging on and on and on, people talking about this controversial thing. But like I've already mentioned, the Israelites really thought the end was near. But really, they had a long way to go. They really, really hoped the end was near, maybe I should say. They were thinking, this is it, we've done it, now all we've got to do is walk into the promised land and take our rightful spot. They're looking back and they're saying that Pharaoh is defeated. We've, we've left Egypt. 
We're no longer slaves. We've seen all these plagues. They've endured all of them. We've endured some. We've seen the Red Sea part. In fact, there's a whole Red Sea full of Egyptian soldiers right behind us to prove that God is on our side. We're following that pillar of cloud. We're following that pillar of fire. We've got it good. Let's sing some songs of praise. That's one of the most important things that we can all do, isn't it? Sing songs of praise to our Lord. We've done that today already. I hope you all enjoyed it today because I really enjoyed leading today. And that's exactly what the Israelites are going to do. They're going to look back and they're going to say, Wow! Look what God has done in our lives right now. Look around you. Look at all the awesome things that are happening. Let's sing. Let's rejoice. Let's celebrate. If anything, they're going to make a sigh of relief. Just, ugh. You know Moses is making that sigh of relief. They've been on his back. Oh, thank you, Lord. You've made it. You've helped us through. Now we're in here. His sister, Miriam, she's going to lead some singing, some dancing, some rejoicing. They're going to get tambourines out. They are going to worship God all night long. It's going to be amazing. Amazing. And you know what they were doing when they were singing and dancing and rejoicing? They were focused on worship. They weren't saying, oh, no, look who's leading. They were saying, oh, no, look, she's using the tambourine. They weren't saying, oh, no. They clapped during the song. They, they, weren't, they weren't saying, oh, no, what kind of song are we going to use to sing God? Is it a new song? Is it an old song? No, they didn't care about any of that. They cared about worshiping God. Why are you here today? Why are you here today? Is it because you like the old music? Is it because you like the new music? Is it because you like the band? Is it because you were hoping to hear a trumpet player? I'm sorry, next week I'll be back with the trumpet. <laughs> are you here because you wanted to look and say, this is what I don't like and this is what I do like? Or are you here to worship God? I promise you, every song we sang today and will continue to sing in this church worships God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why I want you to be here. Not to be critics. Not to have, uh, you know, just your way. But instead, to worship God. That's our mission at this church. To worship God, to reach people, and to worship Him with everything that we do. Everything that we play. Everything that we sing. Every move that we make in our lives. With singing, with dancing, and rejoicing. Exodus 15, 20. I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. Has God triumphed in your life? Has God triumphed in your life? <clears throat> he has mine. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Lord, for triumphing in my life. I know I've got a long way to go still. I'm still, I'm still running that race. But when I look around, I see something. I'm winning the race because I have Christ in my heart. Because I know that Jesus forgives each and every mistake that I make. I say praise God to that. And I say things are looking up. Oh, things are looking up indeed. Whenever I look at my life and I say, I'm so glad I've got Jesus in my heart, I know that things can only look up from here. This is kind of where the Israelites are. They're looking and they're saying, good times. We've had some good times, and now let's continue these good times. And just think back now to all the good times you've had in your life. With your family, with your church, because of your faith. Man, we've had plenty of good times in this church. We're going to continue to have a lot of good times. I expect more good times soon. There's no better time we have here than when someone gives their life to Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we've recognized that victory. We recognize it in our own lives. We recognize it in the lives of others. It's not too hard to recognize the fact that we're winning that race. And when we get that sense of confidence, we feel like nothing can stop us now. Nothing will stand in our way from reaching out to a multitude of lost, to a multitude of people that don't know Jesus, to, to continuing on our road to victory and bringing everybody that we can with us. Nothing can stop us now. But, we need to keep remembering that looking up with an optimistic Christian attitude is very important. We've got to have that optimistic Christian attitude throughout our lives. Not negative. Not going to be negative. We're going to be optimistic. We're going to be positive thinkers. We're going to say, yes, we can reach people. And yes, I can continue to live my life as a Christian. But, unfortunately, for the Israelites and for just people in general, we can't help ourselves. Sometimes we grumble. 
And let me tell you something. God hears you grumble. He does. And each and every one of us has done it. I don't care who you are. You can be the most optimistic, positive person in the entire world. There's been at least one time where you've grumbled a little bit. And maybe even you've caught yourself later and said, man, I shouldn't have done that. The thing about that, though, when's the last time you grumbled about something? When's the last time you complained about something? When's the last time you were a little overly critical? God hears it. He does. And God tells us to be encouraging. God tells us to build each other up. Are you doing that with your Christian brothers and sisters? Or are you grumbling because things didn't go exactly the way you wanted them to go? Moses is going to deal with this. He's quickly going to go from a hero to a zero. You like that one, Amy? I thought you would. <laughs> Batman's not really a hero, I don't think, but that's, that's for Amy Quisenberry. If you don't know, she loves Batman. He's, this is what Moses is going to do, though. He's going to be that hero, that rock star. Moses, you've led us out of Egypt. Awesome. But now, real quickly, even though the Red Sea's right behind him, full of a bunch of chariots and dead Egyptian so soldiers, they're, now they're going to start saying, Moses... What have you done for me lately? What have you done? Why have you let us out here to burn up and die in the wilderness? Why? Now you've got to think about this too. Scripture says that the Israelites came to Moses grumbling about water, about food, about a number of things. The whole the Israelite, it doesn't say just one or two. It says the Israelites came. This is a tough thing. This is a very tough thing. I can tell you, here's, here's something that I've learned since a young man from preachers all around. And it goes for each and every one of us too. All right? You can have a room full of 101 people. 101 people could be in a room. And 100 of them, 100 of them afterwards are going to come up and say, good job, good service, praise God. But just one of them, just one, is going to come up and say, I don't like that sermon. I didn't like those songs. I didn't like the way offering or communion meditation went. I didn't like the tie you had on. I didn't like that you didn't have a coat on. Your shoe looks kind of old. It is. You know? I didn't like the illustration you used. Whatever the case may be. All right? That's just, that's just me from a preacher example. Guess what I'm going to think about when I go home? It's really hard to say, let's stay positive. 100 people said good job. It's real easy to say, oh, man. You preachers, we want to please everybody. It's really hard to even one isn't happy with the job you're doing. Again, the same goes for each and every one of you in whatever profession you may do, whatever thing that you might apply yourself to in your life. If 100 people say good job and one says, uh-uh, that's going to be tough, isn't it? That's what you're going to think about. That's what's going to bother you the most. So now let me ask you, are you the one behind the one in 100 versus one? Or are you one of the 100 that's saying good job, encouragement, Build you up. Are you one of the ones that look at your neighbor right now? Look at the people next to you. Are you building them up? Are you saying, keep up the good work? Are you saying, let's continue to work on this faith thing together? Or are you saying, eh, I don't know about this one. Are you the one behind the one in a hundred versus one? I think that's something that we all need to reflect upon. Because I, I have a sneaking suspicion that we've all been that one at some point in our lives. We've all been that one. We've got to make sure that we're not. I'm not saying that we just have to go do what everybody else is doing. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that it's not okay to have some constructive criticism sometime for everybody. That's okay, too. But are you negative? Are you negative? Think about that. I think that's something we all need to reflect upon this week. It's, uh, it's going to be real hard for Moses, though. He's going to have a bunch. And here's, here's something I thought of. I wish I had a picture for this, and I don't. But Moses is dealing with these people. They don't know what he's gone through. They, don't, they haven't been in leadership. They haven't done the things that he... He is God's chosen man here. God has chosen Moses specifically to lead. There's no boat, right? It's not a dictatorship, but Moses is in charge. He's the guy that God has put there. But now you've got some people coming up. They know better. They know better than Moses. You know, they're not God's chosen person, but, but they definitely know better. Uh, I can just see someone coming up to Moses and saying, Moses, you know, I think that this is the way you ought to do it. I think I should know, uh, because one time I had a sister's cousin's uncle's brother that was in a similar position as you. I think that, that I should know exactly what's going on. Oh, and by the way, I did stay at Holiday Inn Express last night. 
I thought I'd get a better reaction to that. I don't know. <laughs> it's real, real easy. You know, uh, Andy doing this Boy Scout thing. Uh, Andy works with the railroad still, right, Andy? How, how would it be if I went up to Andy and said, you know, Andy, let me tell you all about the railroad. I should know I've been on a train once or twice. Because that's how the people are doing Moses right now. That's exactly how they're doing it. And Moses is going to get aggravated and he's going to do a little grumbling himself. How could you not be discouraged? How could you not be aggravated? There are so many lessons we can learn from the Israelites, folks. There are so many. What are they going to do, though? They're going to be fickle. Leave that picture up for a second, Ryan. They're going to ask God. They're going to, they're going to come to Moses. They're going to say, Moses, we got no water. We're going to die thirst. So what does Moses do? He goes to God. God says, Moses, go, go, go tell that rock to give us water. God gives them water. They say, Moses, we're hungry. You brought us out here to starve to death. Moses prays to God. God sends a manna, heavenly bread, on the ground for them every single morning. The Israelites grumble some more. But now we've got no meat. We don't have any meat. We're meat eaters. God sends them quail. Your head quail, it's actually pretty good, a little greasy, a little greasy, but actually pretty good type of bird to eat. See, the Israelites, they're going to go from praising God to grumbling against God, from praising God to grumbling against God, from praising God to grumbling against God. They're the most fickle people ever, ever. This is something, this is something my dad taught me. Now, that is not the proper spelling for fickle, and I realize that. That's why it's in the bulletin. But this is a good way for you to remember how the Israelite people were. They were the first in criticism against the Lord. The first in criticism against the Lord. Fickle people means they're going to go flip-flop and they're going to go back and forth. What's it going to be? Praise, grumble, praise, grumble. The Israelites most definitely are fickle. The Lord doesn't want fickle from you. Guys, He doesn't. He doesn't want you to be fickle with Him. He wants trust and obedience. Philippians 2.14, do everything without complaining and arguing. You're failed at that. Guilty. Yeah, thank you. Do everything without complaining and arguing. See, is grumbling trusting God? I don't think it is. Is grumbling and complaining <coughs> and arguing being obedient to God? Not according to Philippians 2.14. It's not. Trust and obedience. But you know what? Here's the good thing. We're going to have one more victory. Once again, God's going to have one more victory. Because he's going to get the people through that. And now they're going to face another task. Now they're going to face an army. The Amalekites had come. And they were going to make sure that the Israelites did not come into their homeland. Did not get to where they were trying to go. The Amalekite army was bigger and stronger and tougher. But don't forget. Don't forget. With God on your side, you can accomplish anything. And God's going to tell them to stand strong for victory. Oh, and there's one more thing. And I've got some uh, volunteers. I kind of forced them into it a little bit. But I could get Brandon to come up. Sam, Hunter. These guys are going to help me with a little illustration today. Let's not forget the mighty staff. I want you to stand right here. I don't want you to stand too far behind me. Because I don't fully trust you with this in your hand behind my back. <laughs> Take this staff. Brandon, you guys can just have a seat for right now. Now, God tells Moses, God tells Moses, <laughs> you're so happy to be up here, aren't you? <laughs> God tells Moses, he says, Moses, go up above that hill. You're going to send your armies out in the battle. And as long as you hold my staff above your head, your armies are going to win. Put the staff above your head. Now, hold it up there real high for me. And what we'll say is, as long as you have that staff above your head, I'm going to preach a good sermon here on this third point. If that thing starts to drop, though... I might just start to muddle it up a little bit. So keep it up. All right, keep it up for me. <laughs> I know it's probably getting a little heavy on you already. That thing has got to weigh at least, what, 30, 40 pounds. <laughs> God tells Moses to stand on that hillside with that, that staff over his head and to stand strong. Ladies and gentlemen, are you standing strong? Are you giving God one more victory? think that we need to, right? I think we all need to keep trucking forward with that. Keep on keeping on and stand strong for that victory that we have and only have through Jesus. But the fact is, you can imagine now, fast forward for me just a little bit. Moses is up there for hours. His arms start getting really 
tired. But, but, sometimes we need a little help from our friends. Moses' brother Aaron and one of the elders, or her, come up and they start holding up his arms. Just each of you grab an arm and kind of hold him up there. Don't let those arms fall. We want that victory today. But it even gets worse. It even gets a little help from friends goes a long way, doesn't it? Those moments that we really think, oh, oh, I'm really starting to fall away from my victory through Jesus. That's when we have our Christian brothers and sisters right there. That's when we have our church family right there by our side to say, hey, it's going to be okay. We're going to have some victory. Quit the grumbling and praise God instead. Let's sing some songs of praise. He gets so tired he has to sit down on a rock. Well, don't put the staff down. Now we're on. <laughs> you guys keep holding his arms up for him. <laughs> Now, that helped a little bit, then holding your arms up, right? You can imagine how Moses must have felt that day, though, having a staff bigger and heavier than this one for hours over his head. That would have definitely, he, he would have definitely built some uh, triceps up, you know? He would have been a lot stronger maybe the next week. The fact is, as long as he held that up there, Israelites are winning. If he starts to drop it a little bit, they start to lose. But it's just the same thing for us. This is just a great illustration for us in our lives. <coughs> Luke 2.19 By standing firm, you will win life. When Moses stood firm with that staff over his head, the Israelites won the day. If you stand firm in the Word of God and know you don't have to hold it over your head, but you do have to hold it in your heart, you will also win. Thanks, guys. Round of applause for you It's okay, we're gonna be all right. War's over. <laughs> so, as we come to a close today, again, thanks, fellas. I appreciate you. Let me put you on the spot like that. As we come to a close, let me ask you: Are you on again, off again? Are you one of those that prays and then grumbles and then praises and then grumbles? Things are good, things are bad. Things are good, things are bad. Are you someone that thinks they know better than everybody else? Are you someone that wants it just your way? And that's it. Are you someone that comes here to worship God? To do whatever you can to help this congregation, this church, reach out to people that are lost? I take one thing for granted right now. There's some of you out there who still need the Lord. But every one of you are here today because you wanted to be here, because you chose to come in here. No one forced you to be here today. I say praise God for that. But you know what else I say? I said, you don't have the Lord in your heart. Today is a good as day as any to give us a reason to praise God for that one more victory. This is the last thing I want to leave you with. That optimistic trust and obedience will give you victory through Christ. Notice I didn't say it may give you victory through Christ. Optimistic trust. Don't, don't trust Him negatively. Ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't do that. Instead, look at what we've got. Look at the victory that we have through Jesus. I praise God for our family. I praise God for my family. I praise God for my church family. I praise God for our heavenly family. And the only way we can do it is through optimistic trust and obedience through Jesus. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this time that we had to come together. And to be optimistic as a church family. Lord, we know that sometimes we grumble. We're so sorry for that, Lord. Forgive us for that. We know that you've asked us not to grumble. But still, Lord, in our, we're humans. We, we mess up. And we're so sorry. Help us to instead to look up with optimism each and every day. And know that we are here. We are part of this church family to worship you. To optimistically trust you. And Lord, most importantly, to, to be obedient to you. Just now, Lord, I ask that you will touch at least one person here today. And Lord, maybe, maybe today is the day that someone will come down the aisle and give their life to you. Or maybe today is the day that someone sitting here with us right now, one of our church family, instead just has that moment of strengthening that they need. Lord, I ask that you will help us to continue to grow as a church family, grow stronger and more obedient. Lord, we love you. We ask all these things in your son Jesus, who gives us life in the most precious name. 
Amen. Would y'all please stand as we have our hymn of opportunity. Like I said, today is just a great opportunity to give God a reason and the angels a reason 